pretty good. Great. You guys excited about the contest tomorrow? Not really. No? Yeah, I'm not picking up a lot of excitement, but, you know, hopefully you can muster that excitement tonight uh, as you complete your training. Um, so as we will usually do today, I will we'll be introducing some new material, but just kind of setting the, the groundwork so that we can uh, kind of get moving quickly on Monday. Um, but if anybody has any questions about uh, the material that's kind of more relevant to your upcoming contest, I'm happy to, to talk about those today. Um, today's lecture won't be super long, but anyone who wants homework help and wants to stick around after the lecturing, um, that's uh, encouraged as well. So if you've been doing the homework and you're still, you still have a few issues or, or problems, then we can look at that after the lecture today. Uh, but did anybody have any um, sort of general questions, things that you feel, you know, still aren't clear that you'd like to see a little bit more on uh, right now? No? Okay. Well, so today we are going to start talking about a, a kind of a different scenario for Newton's laws. So it's, it's really still Newton's laws. It's not totally different and it will be relevant to a certain degree to what's on your contest, but these particular examples will not be on your contest. So, um, you know, let's, let's get on the same page. We're talking about Newton's laws and in particular, net force equals MA. And so far, when we have been talking about acceleration, so far in this class, every time we talk about acceleration, we mean something is either speeding up or slowing down. However, there is another scenario where an object can be accelerating, but it is not speeding up or slowing down. So that, in English, that doesn't really make sense, but mathematically speaking, it does make sense. Um, maybe it doesn't make sense yet. Can anyone think of an example where something would be accelerating, but it, it doesn't speed up or slow down? Now, this isn't so easy to, to think about. Um, let's remember what the definition of acceleration is. It's change in V over change in T, okay? So what I'm telling you is it's possible to have an acceleration, which means our velocity is changing. It's possible for your velocity to change without speeding up or slowing down. Can anybody think how a velocity could change without speeding up or slowing down? Looks like I stumped you guys. Okay, this will be a good contest question. No, I'm, I'm just, I'm just kidding. Um, so, well, remember a velocity is a vector, right? It's a vector. And so if the vector changes its direction without changing its length, then that would be necessarily involving an acceleration. Okay, so but when we change the velocity, there's two pieces that can change, the magnitude and the direction. When the magnitude changes, we say the object is speeding up or slowing down. When the direction changes, we don't really have a special word for that. We say it's turning, okay, it's turning. So the, the case that we're talking about now, today, and, and moving into next week, is what happens when an object um, you know, when it's changing direction, but without changing speed, that also is an acceleration. So it also requires a net force. So the kind of stereotypical um, example we typically give for something like this is um, something just moving in a circle. 
Okay, so if something moves in a circle, say the center circles right about there, um, hmm, that's not really the center. It's hard to find the center of the circle after you draw the circle. Okay, so if I have an object that is moving around in a circle at constant speed, that would be the, the kind of perfect example of something that is changing its direction all the time, but not changing its, um, its speed. So let me draw some velocity vectors here just so we can visualize this. So maybe I have an object and its velocity looks like that at one point in time and then some later point in time it looks like that. So we would have a V initial and a V final. So what is this object? Maybe this object is a car and you know we're looking at the car from the top. So it's driving around in a circle. Now, if I wanted to characterize that acceleration, I would have to be able to subtract the vectors. So we know how to subtract vectors. We, um, you know, if I want to do V initial plus V final, then I would add them tail to head. But I want to not add V final. I want to add, actually, I want to do, let me do this again. I really want delta V to be V final minus V initial. So the V final points down and to the right. And V initial, what I was saying is if we were to add V initial to it, we would add the tail of V initial to the head of V final. But I don't want to add V initial. I want to add the negative of V initial. So that this way. This is minus V initial. And that's V final. So when we subtract vectors, it's like adding the negative of a vector. And so the delta V The delta V vector, in this case, just points to the right. Okay. Um, now, if I had drawn this whole picture at the bottom of the circle instead of at the left of the circle, the delta V would not have pointed to the right. Um, we can, you know, we can easily verify that because all I have to do is rotate my picture. And if I rotate the picture, if I had drawn the car at the bottom of the circle, we would have had the delta V vector pointing upward. And if I rotate it, you know, if I had drawn the car on the right hand side of the circle instead of the left hand side, then the delta V would point to the left and so on. Okay, so it's not that the, the change in V always points to the right. Um, how would we, if we wanted to say it most concisely, um, who can tell me in the, the fewest words which way this delta V vector points? Ziad? The center of the circle? Yeah, it just points to the center. That's really um, what it is. So because delta V points to the center, the acceleration also points to the center. So, you know, we could say this is, you know, the acceleration or delta V. Either way, that, that thing, the acceleration or change in velocity over change in time, points toward the center of the circle. And so we give this thing a special name, centripetal acceleration. And that's what the next chapter is really about, centripetal acceleration. So um, this is an A, P-E-T-A-L. So um, the, the word, the etymology of this word, centripetal, it means center, you know, P-E-T, that's a Latin root for seeking. So like, um, like a petition, when you make a petition, 
you're really, it means you're seeking something. And, you know, historically, a petitioner might be a single person who would go to the Pope or go to the king or some authority with like pleading for some case. That would be a petitioner. And um, so this is center seeking, a center seeking acceleration. And that means that the net force must be a center seeking force, a centripetal force. So in this situation, as a car goes around the circle, there must be a force, a net force on the car that points toward the center of the circle. Can anyone tell me what force might be responsible for, for that? Dustin? Would it be gravity? Um, well, it, it could be gravity depending upon the orientation of this circle. So if we imagine the circle is on level ground, um, then gravity would, strictly speaking, you know, so let me try to make this kind of 3D. So here's my car, kind of, you know, the headlights and it's... You know, something like that. So in this case, if I were to draw out the forces um, on the car, it's going to have a it's going to have a normal force and force of gravity, but neither of those is pointing toward the center. Now, if it's um, you know, if the car's on a a hillside or something like that, then there, there could be some component of gravity that maybe points toward the center of the circle, depending on uh, the orientation of my circle. But in this case, the way I'm envisioning it, it can't be gravity. So does anyone uh, have another idea? So it's actually not obvious until you hear it, and then I think it becomes obvious. The force that's responsible for keeping the car going in a circle is friction. That's why if you're going around a circle and you hit a patch of ice, you don't keep going in a circle. You just slide right off of the road. Okay, so you cannot turn quickly if you don't have enough friction. That's why, um, you know, that's why sometimes on a, an exit ramp on the highway, there will be this sort of yellow sign that says speed limit 15 miles per hour. And you look at that and you go, ah, pff, you know, 15 miles per hour. Well, that's talking about if it's like really slick, freezing rain or something like that, you better slow down. Because if you go, you know, beyond a certain speed, you don't have enough friction to make that turn. Okay, so, but it's, friction is, friction is so weird because uh, we're used to thinking of friction as being backward, and that's true if we're slowing down, but friction will be forward if we're speeding up, and if we're turning, friction is gonna be pointing sideways. In fact, that is why we turn the wheels of the car. In this case, the wheels will be turned to the left to try to create some friction pointing toward the center of the circle. And the real picture, okay, the real picture, let me use over here green. The real picture would be that the friction from the tires would point a little bit forward. Like it, it's pointing to the left, but not at a right angle. But then there would be some air resistance. And the combination of the air resistance and the friction winds up acting like we just have the friction pointing toward the center. So in, in the real world, it's, it's a little more complicated than how we're going to make it in our physics problems. Because in the real world, we have to include air resistance as part of the net force. Okay, but for us, in this case, the friction would be the centripetal force. 
And so I guess, you know, what I'm stressing here is that as we start to talk next week about centripetal force, the centripetal force is not a new force. It's just a new scenario. It's a new name. It's like when you get a new job, you're not a different person. You just have a new job, and, but you're the same person. So the friction in this case would be the centripetal force. In a different problem, it could be gravity that is the centripetal force. Maybe someone else gets that job for the day. It could be the tension in the string. It could be the normal force or any combination of those things. But it is not a new magical force like gravity, but, but different. It's not a magnetic force or something. I mean, it could be. If there's magnets involved, then maybe the magnetic force would be the centripetal force. But really, when we say there's a centripetal force, it's really no different from saying there are X components to forces. We just, normally we break forces into X and Y components. And when we have circular motion, we want to break them into centripetal components and, you know, say Y components. So in this prop picture with the car, instead of splitting my forces into X and Y, I would split the forces into centripetal and Y. Okay, so anyway, that is what we're going to be talking about, tripetal force. And what we have so far figured out is the direction of the centripetal acceleration and centripetal force. But we don't know yet how to figure out how big, how the magnitude of that thing. So the direction. Now, I do want to, um, I do want to, dispel a, uh, a certain idea which some people have and this is this is maybe a little bit a little bit easier to talk about in the classroom because I can kind of gesture and things but some people have probably heard about something called um, centrifugal force has anyone heard of that centri fugal force or centrifugal force. Sometimes people say, raise your hand if you've heard of that thing. Okay, a couple people. Um, if you've heard of that, what is the context that you've heard of that? Anybody remember where you've heard of centrifugal force? Okay, well, maybe it's a good thing if, if you don't know much about centrifugal force or centrifugal force, because those are, let me give you an example. Sometimes um, people do a trick with a bucket of water. I, give me one second. My whiteboard is is acting a little bit um, funny. Funny. I'm just gonna I'm gonna reset my my whiteboard. Give me thirty seconds. Okay, so um, centrifugal. force. I'm just addressing this because a few of you have heard of this and it, it can lead to some misconceptions. So the one of the examples people sometimes use of this is when you have a bucket of water and um, inside the bucket 
you know, um, you know, it has water. And the bucket, you're spinning the bucket in a circle. And what happens is as this thing moves, you know, it has a velocity, the water does not fall out of the bucket. And so how many of you have seen that trick or heard of that trick? Okay. So when we try to analyze the bucket of water and we say, well, why doesn't the water fall out? If we look at a photograph of this, we imagine that there must be some kind of a force, you know, the centrifugal force um, that is responsible for keeping the water from falling. If we try to figure out using our rules for forces, you know, how many forces should be acting on the water, um, we should have gravity and then the bucket is making contact with the water but the bucket is basically pushing the water not upward, but it's pushing it downward. And if I ask, you know, who's pushing the water upward, you cannot answer that question. We can't answer who or what is pushing the water upward. Um, so what's actually happening? What's actually happening is we have the force of gravity and some kind of additional normals. And so the water is going to fall down. Now, normally, water that's moved, or an object that's moving to the right and has a downward force on it, it's gonna move in a parabola. But if we move it fast enough, then this circle comes down faster than the parabola. And so the water, it actually wants to follow this parabolic path but the bucket is in A. And so the bucket actually makes it fall faster than gravity alone would do. Okay, so the reason the water doesn't fall is because it's in motion and it actually is falling. It's just falling in this circular path because the, the bucket doesn't allow it to follow the normal parabolic path. So there are other examples of this. Um, when when I was a kid, this will tell you how old I am, but uh, I used to ride at Six Flags. There was this ride called the Tom's Twister. It was my favorite ride. It was the best ride ever. Has anyone heard of that ride? Dustin, so we know how old Dustin is now. He's old enough to remember the Tom's Twister. This was a great ride. It's um, basically, it's a circular room and you just kind of you stand in the room so there's your head and you know your feet are kind of sticking out so this is an aerial view and then this thing starts spinning and you get a velocity going and the faster it goes the more you feel like a force is pushing you against the wall okay and the walls were i mean this was like they had this really thick old like 1970s shag carpet that was like really rough and the, you get spinning fast enough and the floor will just go and drop a foot. You're stuck to the wall and you go, ah, you know, because you're, you're stuck to the wall. And um, you hope no one vomits because you don't have any idea where that's gonna go. And I've been in that ride personally. And I remember it feels like something is pushing you against the wall. And yet I'm trying to tell you that nothing is pushing you against the wall. Okay, um, has it, how many people, if you didn't ride the Tom's Twister, how many people have been inside, even if it wasn't the particular one I'm talking about? Okay, so some of you uh, know what I'm talking about. Um, now, if someone asked me who's pushing you against the wall, I would look around and say, you know, that's, that's a good question. I, uh, nobody's making contact with me. Where's the contact on me? The contact is between me and the wall. And that's what I'm feeling. I feel contact with the wall, and my mind interprets this as if somebody must be pushing me into the wall. It's not common in my lifetime for walls to be moving, but that's exactly what's happening. This wall is moving. And the same thing would happen if the wall 
walls in your room just suddenly start moving toward you and they hit you and they, you know, they start pushing you. Psychologically, you don't expect the building you're in to start moving. So you would imagine that something is pushing you up against the wall instead of the wall is coming toward you. But that's what's happening. As you spin around, your body wants to move in a straight line, but there is this normal force, and that normal force just keeps pushing you toward the center of the circle, and that's why you keep going in the circle. If the wall disappeared instantly, then, which by the way, I think that would be an even better ride than the Tom's Twister. You're spinning around, and then they just, the walls open up. You would not fly outward. Okay, you would you would instead just follow your velocity vector and you would, you know, go this way. And hopefully they put some kind of big, you know, pillow there for you to land on. That would be I would ride that every time if they had that ride. Uh, at any rate, there's a lot of examples of what happens, what all centrifugal force. And it typically comes from a misunderstanding often because we're trying to analyze something in a reference frame that is moving, like a moving room. Or if you're driving in the car and someone makes a sharp left turn and you feel yourself pulled to the right, you're actually not moving to the right. The car is to the left and your, your body wants to keep moving in a straight line, but your, your brain doesn't really understand that. So you interpret it that you're moving to the right and you feel something must be pushing you to the right, and you would call that thing a centrifugal force, something pushing you out to the outside of the circle. But in fact, what happens is your body wants to keep moving in a straight line, and once you hit the door of the car, if you're in the passenger side, for example, then the door starts pushing you toward the center of the circle. Okay, so all of this is just to say there's no such thing as centrifugal force. Okay, no such thing. So let's um, let's go back and try to analyze this uh, centripetal force again from the beginning. Oops, I wanted that to be black. There we go. We have a big circle, and we're going to have an object that moves around this circle. Let's, let's start the object just on the edge here. It's gonna make our math a little cleaner later. So that would be my B initial. And then sometime later, we're gonna have a V final vector, which is the same length, but now in a different direction. And if, um, if I try to identify the center of the circle, then we could draw the radius of the circle there and there. So those are both the radius, and we're going through some kind of angle theta as we go from you know, point A to point B. And this takes some amount of time. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to find the length of the delta V vector. Okay, the length of it. We know the direction is going to be pointing right toward the center of the circle. But how do I find the length of this thing? So this is, uh, what I'm going to do is kind of, it's a proof, but it's, it's a little abstract. And like I said, today is just to kind of get things rolling. I won't ask you to repeat this proof, um, but, but I want to show it to you. So how do you exactly, if I subtract these two vectors, how do I find the length of the difference? So I'm going to use a, a little bit of a math trick. I'm going to draw a different circle. Okay, This circle is just a math device. Okay, So this circle has a radius that is equal to the um, length of my vectors. So let's see, my initial velocity vector was pointing straight up. Get that red. And my final velocity vector kind of pointed at an angle like that. Let's see. So I'm taking this initial velocity and this final velocity 
and I'm basically putting them at the center of, of a circle coming from the same origin. Okay, and I'm only doing this because I know some math about circles that will help me. Now, where does delta V appear here? Well, to get delta V, I take V final minus V initial. So I have to draw my minus V initial vector there. That's minus V initial. And then the delta V is going to be the resultant vector if I add the V final and the minus V. So delta V is right there, but because this thing forms a parallelogram, we can see delta V is this, what's called a chord on the circle. Okay, so why am I doing all of this? It's because I know how to find the length of a part of a circle. Now there's an angle here. Remember this is the initial and this side is the final. The angle between them, I'm going to call that beta. This is a Greek letter B. I just don't want to call it theta because we already used theta in this picture. But at the end of the day, I'm going to show you that those two angles are actually the same anyway. I just don't want to assume it before we, you know, before we prove it. Okay, so how do I find the length of delta V? Well, here is my assertion. There is an arc length which goes from here to here. And that is the length of the curving piece of the circle. And I'm going to say that the arc length is approximately equal to the length of delta V. Okay, so raise your hand if you can see what I'm talking about. That this straight line and this slightly curved line are almost the same length. Raise your hand if that is makes sense to you. Okay, so I know how to find the length of an arc. And and you, some of you, I would be about like half of you at least have seen this in a math class somewhere, but almost none of you remember it if you have seen it. So I'm going to kind of develop it just as if you never saw this before. Um, so I want to make a little table. Um, here's the arc length and here's the angle. And if we have 360 degrees in a circle, then the arc length would be the entire circle. Does anyone remember the formula for the circumference of a circle? Well, someone probably does remember it, but it's two times pi times the radius of the circle, okay? Raise your hand if that rings a bell. Okay, um, now I, I wanna also talk about the angle in radians. Now some of you have probably not learned about radians, but many of you probably have. Um, raise your hand if you ever saw radians in a math class before, even if you barely remember it. Okay, most students have seen it. Raise your hand if you have no idea what radians could possibly be good for. Come on, raise your hand. You all have an idea what radians are good for? Okay, someone tell me what radians are good for. I'll tell you honestly, when I was taking math classes, and I love, I love math, so I didn't really protest or anything, but I always felt like radians were kind of pointless. Like, what's the point of this? I already know how to do degrees. Why would I want to do this other weird thing? For those of you who don't know what radians are, it's a way of taking a circle. Instead of breaking it into 360 degrees, we break it into two pi radians. And when I first learned this, I thought this is totally bizarre because we're breaking a circle into, I mean, two pi is like 6.28 something. It's a weird, infinitely non-repeating decimal. It's an irrational number. Why would I want to do that? And I never asked why would we break a circle into 360? Um, does anyone know why we break a circle into 360 degrees? No. 
no fair Googling it. So we break the circle in 360 degrees because there's 360 days in a year, right? Well, when people were first doing circles, that's what they thought. They thought, you know, surely it couldn't be 365 and a quarter because that would be a really weird number. And the perfection of, you know, the heavens would indicate that, you know, they're the earth. We're talking about how long it takes for that constellations to return to the same pattern. That takes around 360 days. And it was thought it must be exactly 360, even though we know that that is off. So anyway, if you like 360 degrees, it's based on a misperception of the length of the year. And if we lived on a different planet with a different length year, we would have, have a totally different number there. Okay. Anyway, I just want to talk about degrees and radians at the same time. Now, what if we do only half a circle? If I only do 180 degrees, does anyone know what the circumference would be for just half a circle? Ziad. Pi R. And how are you getting that? I'm just thinking that if 2 pi r is the circumference of 360 degrees, then pi r should, if it's just half, like 180, should just be half the circumference. Yeah, pi exactly. R. Exactly right. Um, and what would the angle and radiance be? You know that? Anyone know that? Chat? Uh, just pi. Yes, it's just pi. And so if we do only a quarter of a circle, the arc length will be, you know, I'm cutting it in half again, so the arc length would be pi over 2 times r, and the angle and radians is going to be just pi over 2. And we could keep doing this for a long time until we eventually see a pattern. There is a pattern between, you know, the S column and the radiance column. And that pattern is that the arc length is just equal to r times the angle, but only in radians. And this formula is the reason why we use radians. If we don't have this formula, then radians aren't really good for anything. But radians make this formula very, very easy. So um, some of you probably saw this somewhere in a geometry or math class. Um, but like I said, even if you've seen it, it's almost certain that you forgot it. So I'm going to use it, though. The arc length of any circle is the radius of the circle times the angle through which that arc length is measured. So in this case, that angle is called beta. That's like a B. If you don't know how to draw that. It's like a B with a tail. Okay. And the radius of this circle, remember, this is just a, a math circle where I just drew both of these velocities coming from the center of the circle. And I, I put them in a circle because I know they're the same length because we're talking about a car driving around a track that doesn't speed up or slow down. So the length of these velocity vectors, I'm just going to call that b, that is the radius. And so we can say that the delta v vector is approximately equal to the velocity times this angle beta. Okay. Um, any questions so far? Okay. So the idea then is, I said it's approximately true. I think we can probably all agree. Let me draw another circle. If I if I have another circle that uh, I'm just going to draw a you know a smaller circle so I have room. But if I had drawn my vectors separated by a wider angle, so that um, this is delta v and this is s then this approximation would not be good, okay? Can you see that? Right? If you can see, the approximation would be pretty crappy if I had a big angle, okay? But the reverse is 
true also that if I made this angle very small, okay, then we cannot really tell the difference between the delta V and the arc length. So the smaller the angle gets, the better this approximation becomes. Okay, that's going to be important. Um, so let's see if we can find the acceleration. So the acceleration is delta V or delta T. And so the acceleration magnitude is approximately equal to V times beta over delta T. So using that, delta V is approximately equal to V times beta. So how long is delta T or how big is delta T? Well, that comes back to our original picture and how fast we're moving. So delta T is how long it takes to go from point A to point B. Well, we know that, um, you know, distance is velocity, velocity time. So the time would be the distance over the velocity. We're moving at constant speed, so we don't need to use a, one of the fancy master equations. Just the time would be the distance over the velocity, and the distance would be an arc length. But it's not the arc length of that weird imaginary math circle that I made. It's the arc length of this real, actual, the, the track that the car is driving around. And that arc length would be just the radius of the track times the angle. So that's going to be r times theta over v. That's my expression for the time. The time depends on how big the track is, how fast the car is going, and how much angle the car drives through in that time interval. So if I put that in, we have A is approximately V beta over R theta over V. And I know you guys love fractions of fractions. I know, you, I know that's your favorite part of fractions with fractions in the fractions. But if you don't love it, then you want to get rid of the fraction on the bottom. And the way I would do that is by multiplying top and bottom by V over V, which is just one. So I can do that. And what happens is it cancels the V on the bottom, and it leaves me with V times V on the top. So if I simplify that, I'm getting approximately equal to V squared beta over R times theta. So I know this is a very convoluted thing, but we are almost at the finish line. And the final, final result is actually quite simple. So the last thing for me to show you is that if we take a limit that the angle gets very, very small, beta and theta are both getting small, and they are equal to each other, so they're going to cancel out. So let me show you that um, using this picture. So what is beta exactly? Beta is the angle we get when we put V initial and V final starting in the same point. So I'm just going to move the V initial up here, just kind of moving it up there. And therefore, the angle right there is called beta. So a couple of other lines to just help us see some things. A horizontal line there that's parallel to this radius on the bottom allows me to see that I have the angle theta. This angle theta is the same as that angle theta. And finally, we have a right angle here between the V final and uh, this line. So this angle in the middle of beta and theta, I'm going to call it alpha. Alpha plus theta must add up to 90 degrees. They add up to 90 degrees. But we can see that alpha plus beta also form a right angle. And so this may be enough to convince you that theta and beta must be the same. But if not, we just subtract the equations. And when we subtract them, we get theta 
minus beta equals zero or theta equals beta. So the beta and theta just cancel out. And we can make the angles as small as we want, getting infinitely close to zero, and they still cancel. And that means that this approximation actually is perfectly accurate. So this is known, I'm going to put a little C here. This is called the centripetal acceleration. And it is, um, you know, it is the component of the acceleration vector that points toward the center of the circle. And this indicates that the size of the acceleration depends on the, how fast the car or object is going and the size of the circle. And that correspondingly means that the amount of force necessary to keep you going in a circle depends on how fast you're going and how sharp or not sharp the turn is. So I want to do one example of this just to kind of have a, a context. Um, well, I'll just draw a new circle. Okay, so there's my circle, and we have a car going around the track. And this circle is perfectly um, horizontal. It's a level track. It's not banked. The, the, the road doesn't slant or slope in any way like a racetrack. It's just like a flat road, like a parking lot. And I want to find the maximum speed Um, if the coefficient of friction equals one, and we maybe have a radius of 30 meters for this turn. So how fast can the car go? So in this case, uh, as I showed you before, the force that has a centripetal component is just friction. So if I want to use Newton's second law, we split this equation into a centripetal direction and the y direction. And again, the y direction, if we maybe we look at our car kind of head on, in the y direction, there's going to be normal force and force of gravity. And then the friction is the one pointing in the x direction. Okay, so that's um, it's not a very desirable car, but it's a car. And so when I do some of the forces in the centripetal direction, it's just friction. And that gives me m times a centripetal. And in the y direction, we have normal minus, let me move that a little bit, normal minus force of gravity equals m times a y. So we're really doing just exactly what we are doing on chapters four and five for your contest. We're just now applying it to circular motion. So the y direction equation tells me that the normal force is just m times g. We know friction is going to be mu times the normal. And now we know that the central acceleration is v squared over r. So the difference here between all of our other examples in chapters four and five is we're not solving for the acceleration now. We now know that the acceleration is a function of the velocity and the radius. And so we use that instead to find the velocity or find the radius. Um, we know mu times normal is mu mg because we solve for the normal force. And that's equal to m v squared over r. The m's cancel. And v squared is equal to mu times r times e. And we get a formula for v 
which is mu times r times g. The particular numbers we have are 1 times 30 times 9.8. That gives me 17.1 meters per second. So there's how fast this car can go. If the car goes any faster than this, something's going to have to happen. If we look at the formula for velocity, the mu, that just has to do with the tires on your car. Okay, now technically, this is a fine point, but this is technically a mu static because road tires use static friction unless they skid. If they start skidding, like you lock up the brakes and they skid, then you're going to get kinetic friction. But when they're rolling, the point of contact with the ground is always stationary momentarily. It sort of rolls and sets down on the ground and then it lifts up, but it doesn't skid or slide. So mu can't really change. That has to do with the type of rubber in your tires and with the road. And g cannot change either because that just has to do with the earth. So the only thing that can change is r. If I try to go faster than 17.1 meters per second, then r has to get bigger. And that means I'm going to drive off of the road to the outside. Okay, let me uh, pause and see if there are any questions. So a few things we see here, the bigger the radius, the faster we can go. And this is why the turns on the clover leaf um, on the highway are really big. Because that, if they're big enough, you can just keep going at the same speed. Now, the cleat turns are additionally banked, which we will talk about next week. That's more complicated, but that allows you to go even faster than, than just friction alone would allow. Um, secondly, if we're driving around and we hit an icy patch. So if I hit an icy patch, the value of mu is going to go way down, maybe from 1 to 0.1. So when mu gets smaller, the velocity can't get smaller. You don't just slow down when you hit ice. I mean, that would be awesome if the universe worked that way. Anytime you're running or driving or something on your bike and you hit a patch of ice, when the friction goes down, you instantly slow down. But that's not what happens. You keep going the same speed. So when the mu gets smaller, the r must get bigger. If mu gets cut in half, r has to double. And so again, if you're driving along and you hit an icy patch, you're gonna, you know, you're gonna get a really big radius, which is almost a straight line, if the if the ice is very slippery. But at any rate, again, you're gonna slide to the outside. In fact, pay attention the next time, um, which may be a while, but the next time maybe in the winter that there's bad weather and you see cars on the side of the road. They will always be on the outside of the turn, okay? They, they're never going to slide off the road to the inside unless, you know, maybe if there's a collision, so something knocked it to the inside. But just cars that slide off the road because, you know, slick roads, that's always going to be the outside of the curve because of this equation. Okay, um, so that's basically just an introduction to centripetal acceleration and centripetal force. Tomorrow you have a contest on forces in general, but when we come back, we're going to dig into centripetal force and centripetal acceleration. We will see examples with roads that have a banked curve, which is a more complicated example. We'll see examples with, um, you know, like a tether ball, a ball hanging on the end of a string, anything that moves in a circle. And probably our most important circular example will be orbits of planets. So we'll finally get to learn a little bit more about Newton's theory of gravity and um, what it says about the orbits of planets. So that'll all be coming next week.
Does anyone have any questions uh, about today's lecture? Okay, so uh, as I said, today um, I'm going to stop the recording, but you can stick around for questions on homework.